with its Alfa Romeo shield front grille, Alfa SZ inspired headlights, telephone dial wheels on every model. This is obviously the new C-segment Alfa Romeo SUV called Tonale. It arrives in Australia in two variants, front wheel drive only with a mild hybrid system, the $49,900 Ti and this, the Veloce, $56,400 before on-road costs with two option packs to go on top of that. And in this case, Montreal Green, unique to the Veloce. Now the first Tonale to arrive in Australia is called the hybrid, although there is no badge on the car to tell you that, you just need to know for when you drive it. It comes in two variants, the TI and the Veloce. They are mechanically identical, which means they have a new 1469cc turbo petrol four-cylinder combined with a 48 volt mild hybrid system with a gear-driven connector to the transmission to give it more of a hybrid feel according to Alpha and a 22 kilowatt lithium ion battery sitting down here. The e-motor gives you 15 kilowatts and 55 newton meters for a bit of extra punch and overall that punch equals 8.8 .8 seconds to 100 and a 212 kilometer an hour top speed with 5.6 litres per 100 kilometers combined fuel consumption. Though, on test, on the launch, we drove two variants. The TI on standard 18 inch wheels, which have 23550 R18 tires, and the dampers that are frequency selective Coney dampers. It averaged seven liters per 100 on mostly country style roads, humming along pretty quickly with an average speed of around 61, 62 Ks an hour, according to the trip computer. The Veloce did the same speed average, but on much tighter corners, really wringing everything out of this car, and it averaged 11.2. So if you want everything from the engine, it's not really gonna be hybrid efficiency, but it does use the battery a lot of the time and start up and cruising around, certainly up to 15 Ks an hour, it's all electric. And Alpha claims that that is hybrid-esque without being a full hybrid because it's a mild hybrid. The Veloce does ride with a little bit more sophistication than the TI, but even then the TI on standard wheels with no options is a pretty decent car. It's just not quite as polished as perhaps it could be given that this is meant to be the metamorphosis vehicle. Now while the Tonale is meant to be Alpha's metamorphosis car from the inside, you would only know that from the technology because here we have a 10.25 inch touchscreen that's really slick and works really well, unlike Alpha infotainment from the past. And we have a 12.3 inch TFT screen here with a bunch of different views that you can choose. My favorite being the Heritage, which takes its cues of the fake analog dials from awesome Alphas of the late 60s and very early 70s. The touchscreen here has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. You do need to option a Lusso pack to get the 14 speaker Harman Kardon stereo instead of just a basic six speaker, which is okay, but the 14 speaker one is way better. The Lusso pack also brings things like eight way electric front seats with perforated leather trim with seat heating and cooling, which is really easily accessible by just pushing the button on the edge of the touchscreen here and you have the options there. It's not embedded somewhere else, which is great and very functional. And the TI and the Veloce both come with crank handle height adjustment and lever adjust backrests. What you lose though in the Veloce that we're driving right now is the Alcantara trim with the red stitching. You just get sort of a dark interior. So with his black headlining, it all is very soft in here unless you option the large sunroof that's available on both variants. Now the standard equipment in both is really pretty good as is the space. The wheelbase of the Tonale is exactly the same as the Jeep Compasses which is 26 36 millimeters which means it's essentially among the smaller of a traditional medium SUV category or in this case a supersized version of a premium small SUV. So you do get quite a lot of room. In the back seat there's really good leg room, a lot of toe room, good headroom if you don't have the sunroof. You don't get any seat adjustment though. It is really just a fairly upright backrest and a cushion that doesn't slide fore and aft. But that is all pretty good, providing you don't wanna sleep back there because you do sit pretty upright. 
Alfa Romeo claims the boot space is 500 litres, but Australian cars all get a 17-inch space saver spare. So that number doesn't include having that underneath, which does suck out a bit of room. It doesn't look like 500 litres to me, but it's still pretty good, pretty well trimmed. The interior also has nice finishes in some areas, but not in others. The steering wheel is great. It's from the Stelvio. It has the stop-start button. It has these lovely spokes. In the Veloce, you get these big fillets of gear shift paddles, which you don't get in the TI. The top of the dash is squidgy, but really quite grainy. As you get lower down, though, the plastics really do start to sort of degrade I suppose in their quality the front doors are hard but with a little bit of an oily finish the back doors are hard with no oily finish and in the back you've got nothing to really grab onto on the doors and you don't have any roof grabs either so when you choose the leather and don't have the Alcantara to hold you in place you'll have to hold onto the front seats in the front the driving position is for the most part really good you sit down nice and low, lower in the manual than you do in the electric, but you still have the steering column directly in front of you in a Porsche style of driving environment, not sort of up and slightly awkward like you are in a Stelvio. So the Tonale does tend to feel reasonably low, though this is very much an SUV seat positioning riding on a car platform. Only 139 millimeters of ground clearance, a towing capacity of 1500 kilos braked, this is a car and in Australia so far only front wheel drive. In terms of technology, the Tonale is easily the most contemporary Alfa Romeo ever. It is the first Alfa with the My Connect app, which you can have on your phone where you can check the analytics of your car. You can pre-program navigation into that. So when you get in your vehicle, it's already ready to go on that. Although you've got wireless Apple CarPlay, so that's probably what I would use. And it also connects with Amazon Alexa at home. So you can ask Amazon Alexa things about your car as well, like fuel level, set the navigation and all that sort of stuff. So it's kind of something where you don't need to have your phone, even though everyone always has their phone on them all the time. And that's the sort of stuff that buyers really want in this class. Alpha reckons that the screen size is best in class and certainly with that Harman Kardon stereo, there's quite a lot of stuff going on here that's really good. One thing I didn't mention about the seating position though is this console in here, my left leg is just pressing up against this hard plastic and that's where the cabin starts to fall down. In the lower end, the plastics really are quite hard and kind of nothing really like it's not as premium as say its German competitors would be even though the price is certainly approaching where they are that said even though it's related to something like the Jeep Compass being on the small wide platform the suspension design struts down the front struts with three links up the back on each side which is unique to this vehicle does give it a level of dynamism that is completely absent in some of the other cars that are on this platform. And I suppose given that this is the beginning of Alpha's electrification and that soon things are gonna be switching to something all electric, having a development of an older platform is probably a wise decision because it means that they're not spending a whole lot of money on something that in a couple of years is gonna to have to be junked for something else. As for the rest of the interior, it's all pretty nicely ergonomic. Apart from that knee thing, the seating's good. You can fit probably a one litre bottle in the front doors, only 600 mil in the back. There's a wireless charging pad in the front here. Everything gets an electric tailgate. You've got a USB-A and USB-C port here. Same in the back with air vents in the back. Every model from July 23 production will have ambient lighting as standard in five colours, which will go across the dash here where all this patterned metal is in this car right now. The Tonale also comes with a five year unlimited kilometre warranty with five years roadside assistance and its servicing is every 12 months or 15,000 Ks with a five year service amount being $3,675. So all of that is reasonably competitive and fairly well covered. I just can't quite get my head around the fact that it just doesn't quite gel together. The drivetrain would be great in a Jeep Compass, but here, I just feel like it just doesn't quite deliver the enthusiast fizz and sparkle that you want out of an Alfa Romeo that has all of the cool detailing that the Tonale relies on so heavily to have that level of pizzazz. I love the Montreal green colour that we have here in this Veloce. I love the handling. It's generally really good. The turn-in's great. The brakes are strong. It's just 
it needs the two litre turbo out of the Stelvio, which is rumoured to be coming. And by the end of the year, we'll also have a plug-in hybrid version, which will have an electric motor on the rear axle to mean it has Q4 all-wheel drive rather than Q2 with an electronic front differential like this car has. And I think that is going to be the beginning of what the Tonale is capable of. This isn't really the full metamorphosis yet. This is just scratching the surface. What the engine doesn't give you is some alpha style fizz. It's not bad by any means. It's actually a pretty decent motor. It has really good torque and good power. 118 kilowatts at 5,750 RPM, 240 newton meters at 1,500 RPM, and an intriguing amount of turbo whistle around 2,000 RPM, which is really the only personality that the engine kind of has. It revs out reasonably well, shifts up at about 6,000 RPM, gives pretty good performance, but it has flaws. And that is that when you're in tight corners and trying to ask it for all of the grunt that it has, it very much torque limits what you've got. And so you're waiting for the steering wheel to come back to straight before it suddenly gives you all of that power and torque. And in the city, when you're driving around with the DNA dial here, which are the drive modes, D meaning dynamic, N meaning natural, A meaning advanced efficiency, but A is super doughy, unless you're in stop-start traffic, don't bother with that. N for natural is where you just might suddenly need complete power like here. Pause, 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 go. It just, and then a bit of axle trend. It just doesn't really have the response that you expect when you have all of that electric stuff combining with it. I think that it's probably because it's tied to the dual clutch and perhaps it's maybe even the gear driven thing. I don't know, I'm not a mechanic, but that is the reality of what it is. Dynamic definitely perks up everything. It gives it a lot more punch. And that punch really does combine well on faster sweeping corners with the dynamic. So here we are into a corner, 2.3 turns lock to lock, which kind of disguises a bit of the fact that the turning circle is nearly 11.6 meters, so it is a little bit fake. And speaking of that, the electric steering doesn't quite have the feel that you want. It doesn't really have any feel. It has this sort of response either side or straight ahead, but it really only has any meat when it's in dynamic, not when it's in natural. So dynamic is really where you get a little bit of the Alfa Romeo-esque sportiness out of this car. And much like its distant cousin, the Ferrari range, you can hit the damper button in the middle and it'll go back to comfort damping. So you have the drivetrain and the steering and all the other stuff in the sporty mode and you have more comfortable dampers. But they even said sport is still really quite drivable on most roads. Now, what all that technology doesn't cover is some safety stuff in the TI. You need to option a technology pack to get a bunch of safety systems that are already standard in the Volante. So what do we think of the most technologically advanced Alfa Romeo of all time? The first Alfa with any kind of electrification. I like it but I don't think it's quite there. I think it's a nice basis to work from and it certainly has a really good sporty model in there. Quadrifoglio has not been confirmed. A two litre turbo petrol is rumored, but potentially only for some markets, maybe not for Australia. We know we're getting a plug-in hybrid and we know we're getting all-wheel drive for that. But right now, this front wheel drive, mild hybrid 1.5 turbo is a good car but it's not a great one. It has some really good points, but it just doesn't quite gel it all together. This Tonale here is the great basis for something that could be really good, and that would have a two liter turbo petrol or be a Quadrifoglio model. Potentially the plug-in hybrid all-wheel drive that comes later in the year would add an extra level of dynamism to this car, but right now, this is a strong handling, reasonably well-polished, roomy and comfortable vehicle that has some cool colors, some great design details, and a lot of other stuff with an engine that's just a bit meh. It's efficient, it's competent, but it doesn't quite match the character of the car. And I feel like if 70% of buyers are gonna buy the Veloce, which is what Alfa thinks they will buy, then is that engine and that drivetrain gonna be enough to satisfy their taste for a bit of Italian passion? I'm not so sure about that.